Oh, we've seen one bifurcation in the Lorentz system, but there's more out there, and there's more than just bifurcation of equilibria. Let's consider what happens if we start looking for a Hopf bifurcation. So let's start with that pair of equilibria that exist when r is bigger than 1. That is plus or minus square root of b times quantity r minus 1, plus or minus square root of b times quantity r minus 1, and r minus 1. Those are the x, y, and z values. If we linearize at those points, look for the eigenvalues of the linearization, we have the characteristic polynomial lambda cubed plus quantity 1 plus b plus sigma times lambda squared plus b times quantity r plus sigma lambda plus 2 sigma b times quantity r minus 1 set that equal to 0. We cannot solve this easily, but what we can do is think. What is it that we're looking for again? We're looking for convection rules in the atmosphere where the air rises and then it falls and rises and falls. That is oscillatory in nature. So we really ought to be looking for a Hopf bifurcation as the most likely event that is going to lead to some sort of periodic motion. Well, that's swell, but how are we going to do that? We've got our characteristic polynomial, and it's big and complicated, and we've already sort of given up on trying to solve that. But in the case of a Hopf bifurcation, we know that this is going to occur when we have a pair of pure imaginary eigenvalues, something of the form lambda equals plus or minus i times omega for omega some constant. In this case, what we can do is look for those pure imaginary eigenvalues by substituting that into the characteristic polynomial. Let's do that. What happens when we substitute in lambda equals i times omega? We get, in the cubic term, omega cubed times i cubed. In the quadratic term, quantity 1 plus b plus sigma times omega squared times i squared. In the linear term, b times quantity r plus sigma times omega times i, and in the constant term, 2 sigma b times r minus 1. Set that equal to 0, we can take those powers of i and separate out into the real and imaginary parts. The real part of this involves the quadratic term and the constant term, and it gives us quantity 1 plus b plus sigma times omega squared equals 2 sigma b times quantity r minus 1. Solving this for omega squared gives us 2 sigma b times quantity r minus 1, all divided by 1 plus b plus sigma. Oh wait, we still have the imaginary parts to deal with. So looking at the cubic term and the linear term, and moving things around gives us omega cubed equals b times quantity r plus sigma times omega. We know that we don't want omega equal to zero, so we cancel out an omega from both sides, and we get omega squared equals b times quantity r plus sigma. And this is it. This is what we've been looking for. We have those two equations for omega squared. We set them equal to each other, and what do we get? We've got that b times quantity r plus sigma equals 2 sigma b times quantity r minus 1, all divided by 1 plus b plus sigma. There's clearly a b from both sides. We can cancel that out. And let's clear out that denominator multiplying on both sides. What we get is r times quantity 1 plus b plus sigma plus sigma times quantity 1 plus b plus sigma equals 2 sigma times quantity r minus 1. Now remember, our goal is to vary r and look at that as the parameter with which bifurcations come into being. So I see that 2 sigma r on the right-hand side. I'm going to move that over to the left-hand side. And then I've got r times quantity 1 plus b minus sigma. Everything on the right-hand side, moving stuff over, that gives me, what, uh, negative 2 sigma, and then minus sigma times quantity 1 plus b plus sigma. If I collect terms in there and then divide out by that 1 plus b minus sigma, slap a negative sign in front of things to cancel some unpleasant stuff out, what we get in the end is r equals sigma times quantity 3 plus b plus sigma all divided by sigma minus b minus 1. 
What is this? Oh, this is where we have pure imaginary eigenvalues. So as we move R through this particular parameter value, we have a Hopf bifurcation. So let's summarize what we have found for Lorentz. As we take this parameter R and increase it, then what do we get? Well, we want sigma to be bigger than b plus 1. But at the classical values where sigma is 10, b equals 8 thirds, that's not a problem. Then what we have is a Hopf bifurcation at the parameter value r equals sigma times quantity 3 plus sigma plus b, all divided by sigma minus b minus 1. Now this is happening at the two equilibria in this system, those two guys off to the side that came from that supercritical pitchfork. So it's actually kind of a double hop bifurcation. Eh, not really. I mean, it's a single hop bifurcation, but it's happening at these two points at the same parameter value because the system is kind of symmetric. Now, the question. What type of Hopf bifurcation is it? Is it supercritical? Is it subcritical? How would we figure that out? Well, it's not so easy. But, nice guy that I am, I'm going to tell you. It's subcritical! Oh, man. That's kind of scary. I mean, subcritical bifurcations tend to be really dangerous, right? And it's, wow, it's kind of weird if you think about it because... Wait a minute. Where did the... What? What is going on? I thought it was going to be this thing where you've got these nice things and then there's sinks and then they give off a stable limit cycle. But no, that is not what is happening here. Ooh, what are we going to do? Penny!